The other thing that I realized I forgot to mention earlier is who I am, um, and, and I should have said this. Um, I want to welcome all of you to Hack Jersey, uh, again, especially the newcomers. Um, my name is Tom Mayer, and I am with Debbie, the co-founder of Hack Jersey. Um, my, in my day job, I'm the data editor at Digital First Media, um, and I work in this uh, quasi-futuristic, post-apocalyptic newsroom in Manhattan that we call Project Thunderdome. Um, and at Thunderdome, I work with a team of data developers. Um, and what we do is we create uh, interactive news applications uh, for our uh, partners and newspapers and online properties around the country. Um, we help with supporting their uh, analysis and data projects and, and help them build their web interactives. Um, but in spite of my uh, sort of nebulous, uh, silly title, um, uh, working at Project Thunderdome, I've spent my whole career in newspapers, um, a large part of that in New Jersey. Um, I, before I joined Digital First Media, I was at the Star-Ledger um, for several years, working with some of you there. I was at a local news service, uh, working with reporters, covering uh, town meetings, um, covering <laughs> planning and zoning boards, school boards. Um, before that, I was an editor and reporter at the Herald News. Patterson. Um, so uh, at least for the journalists here, hopefully a lot of that sounds familiar to, to what you've been doing. Um, you know, I, I am one of you. Uh, for the hackers uh, and coders, I'm, I'm becoming one of you. You've assimilated me. Um, what's really fantastic about this weekend, it, obviously, is, is all the creativity here. The fact that this is a uh, an opportunity for these two professions, these two crafts, to come together uh, and to share ideas. Um, obviously, the reporters are very good with research. They're very good with telling stories. And the programmers are very good with systems and figuring out how to make things work, um, how to make things uh, interact uh, online. Um, and together, I think they're amazing opportunities for us to build things uh, far better than what we could do on our own, uh, which is part of what's really exciting. Um, I know this. a lot of you are, on the journalist side are very interested in data journalism. You've heard a lot about it. Some of you are very eager to learn how to code yourself. Um, we're not going to be able to do that this weekend. I can't teach you how to code in, in a half-hour talk or a 24-hour hackathon. Um, what we're really hoping is that you're going to come here and not only share ideas, but see how this process works. Um, see how, how you actually take something from an idea to a, a product um, and what some of those steps are and see the spots where you can, um, you can get involved. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit in this uh, hopefully very brief discussion about what roles each of us can play on our team so we feel like we're all contributing to the competition. Um, so as I said, I, I, I have the, the newspaper background. I'm fully enmeshed in the journalism world. And it's no surprise to anybody that, um, probably particularly to the journalists, that we're very far behind when it comes to technology. Um, the only, one of the only exceptions to that is what's traditionally been called computer-assisted reporting. Um, that this is a type of reporter, and I, I see some of you here who are, are experts in, in this beat. Um, that mines public databases, analyzes them, pulls out the stories from this morass of data, um, and produces them for the paper. Um, but the name itself, computer-assisted reporting, seems a little bit archaic. Um, ben Welch at the LA Times at their data desk, he sums it up pretty well. He talks about in other industries, they, uh, you know, architecture and medicine and business, um, they are so far ahead of where we are. His joke is, uh, only in journalism do we continue to distinguish ourselves with Microsoft Excel. Um, Excel is a very powerful tool, but it should be just one tool. Um, and if there's a whole world for us to learn, and hopefully we can start to learn some of that together. Um, and I'm going to have to apologize to Ben for stealing his joke, um, but I'm pretty sure he open sourced it and wouldn't mind anyway. Um, so in the last five years or so, this computer-assisted reporting model has sort of evolved uh, in a lot of places. Um, involved in, and especially as the web 
has grown. Um, the new technologies have kind of come up, and languages have been easier to learn, um, and moved more into developing and building things for online. To not only analyze the data and write about it as a narrative in print, but also to put it online and let people interact with it. Um, and the interesting part is so much of this uh, is rooted, I think, in the old um, hacker mentality. Uh, now, on the developer side, though, um, there's also some catching up to do. I went into the I iOS iTunes store the other day and searched for Jersey, and all the apps are about Jersey Shore. Um, oh, the Snookify Me one is an on game. There's a lot of them. There are a lot of apps about a television show, um, and there's very few for the iPhone. There's one or two more for the iPad. Um, but Developers, I know we can do better. Um, I know we can tell important stories. And some of these I didn't even realize how the they are. Uh, <laughs> it's incredible. Um, so I think the developers can also bring some of their skills and look to this hacker mentality um, for inspiration. Um, you know, the old hackers, let's take something apart, let's see how it works, and then let's make something better. Um, you know, the old joke is that there are three virtues uh, for programmers. There's laziness. Um, I don't want to do the same dull, repetitive tasks. Um, there's impatience. Uh, I don't want to wait for something to happen. Um, I, I want it to happen now. Um, and, and probably my favorite, which is hubris, which is I can solve any problem with enough code. Um, or should I say with enough of the right code. Uh, this is really exciting coming from the journalism world where everything seems to be broken. Um, our business model is in the shambles. We haven't quite figured out the web. Um, this is exciting to say, if we think about this hard enough, if we share some ideas and improve on what's been done before, we can make it better. We can fix things. Um, so I'm hoping some of that's going to inform us uh, uh, this weekend. Um, you know, this is hard. Uh, this is hard stuff, learning new skills. but. What we can do is we can try to take apart this old news model and put it back together in a better way. Um, we don't have to be stuck in the inverted pyramid uh, and the 45-inch narrative. Um, there, there are other ways we can do things. Um, I know a lot of journalists have been asking me, what can I do? Uh, I'm excited about the idea, but I'm not sure what I can contribute to a team here. Um, I think there are a lot of skills that journalists can bring to this. Uh, they're very resourceful. Uh, we know how to talk to people. We know how to get information. We know how to, we have a great sense of what's engaging and what's significant. Um, we can help the people who know how to build the Smokeify app um, and help them uh, channel those skills into something that's a little more useful, um, certainly a little more educational. All right, so the raw materials for all of this has got to be the public data. And when you bring together good, well-managed, well-cleaned, and analyzed public data, you could bring together the news judgment of the journalists, you bring together the programming skills by developers. Um, I think that's going to be um, the sweet spot uh, here. Um, you know, we use data all the time as reporters, uh, certainly in our reporting, uh, if not necessarily in our presentation sometimes. Um, if we're really lucky in a company, a CSV or an API, uh, most of the time, it's uh, especially in New Jersey, it's locked into PDFs, um, which makes it very difficult. So hopefully we can find some better ways to, to pull this data out. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited that Mark is here um, to talk a little bit about uh, how this has come, up, come about, you know, sort of the evolution of how governments release data in New Jersey and why it's so difficult for us to get it in a usable format. At least I hope that's what he's going to talk about. Um, for the competition, you can use sort of any kind of public data, but we have on our website at hackjersey.com slash public hyphen data, if you haven't seen it, there's a list of more than 50 data sources from around the state. Some of those are ready to go. Um, a lot of them, I think, are, you're going to find require more than a little massaging to make them useful. Um, but that's also part of my ulterior motive, I guess, for all of this, is to have us get a sense of what the state of public data really is in New Jersey and how far we have to come still. 
Um, so we want to use some of these techniques of programming and web development to not only make our reporting better, make our analysis better, but make it better for our readers. Um, so I want to run through just a couple of examples. Um, Matt Erickson is going to show you some amazing work that his team has done uh, in terms of data visualizations. So I'm not really going to touch uh, on that. Um, they, they sort of have the, the market cornered uh, uh, for right now. Um, but what I want to do is just a few examples of varying degrees of involvement um, and difficulty, I guess, using some of these ideas of using programming skills to automate, to scrape, to clean, um, and, to, and to make it interactive. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is a project that my team did. Uh, I guess I wouldn't say it was a project. This was a breaking news story. Uh, as a result of some court records, um, some court cases, the Boy Scouts of America were compelled by the court to release uh, thousands of files that were uh, informally known as their perversion files. These were records that were kept internally with the Boy Scouts about scoutmasters and leaders uh, who were accused of uh, sexual abuse of scouts um, over the years. These were all over the country, these cases. Almost none of them uh, were reported to the police. They just had this tiny little file that was supposed to be a blacklist that you go away from the scouts and not be involved anymore. Um, but instead, of course, a lot of people would just move and join other troops somewhere else. Um, so what happened was on a Friday afternoon at about 3 o'clock, a law firm uh, under court order released all of these records. They released more than 1,300 records. There were some duplications on a really awful PHP site. Um, it was not searchable. It wasn't sortable. Um, you had to page through 26 pages of it. Um, if you wanted to look at the documents, you had to click through and fill out a CAPTCHA to open them up. Um, it was really awful. And the worst part of it was after about, I'll be generous and say 15 minutes, um, the entire site crashed. That this law firm had invested some money in making this data difficult to use, but didn't invest any money in um, cloud servers or making sure that it was scalable and able to withhold the load of the international press bombarding their servers. Um, but what we were able to do, luckily, is before they crashed, grab about three of these pages. And in the hour and a half to two hours it took them to get a new server up, we built a script to scrape all of the data um, and to make it accessible. Um, you know, that was a really exciting example for us where we could take this essentially useless. I mean, if somebody wanted to page through 26 pages of thousands of names, um, I guess they could and spend weeks doing it. But it wasn't going to do anything for, certainly for reporters, it wasn't going to do anything for our readers. Um, so we were able to grab it, make it searchable, make it sortable, get it out to our 75 dailies around the country for the reporting, and then some of them ended up putting that database on their website as well, letting their readers um, uh, page through it. Um, it is a pretty elementary example, I guess. It, it wasn't, um, the web interactive wasn't that exciting, but the idea that we could, with some code, save ourselves a lot of heartache and make a better product for our readers um, really energized that my team. This was, like I said, breaking news on a Friday. We had it up within hours, and we had just been around for a couple of weeks. Um, Has anybody seen this? This is called Sightgeist. This is a mobile app from the Sunlight Foundation, which if anybody is interested in open data uh, in America, you should be checking them out. They're amazing. They do basically what Sightgeist does is it tells you what's your location, and it brings in about 30 different uh, data sources. It brings in weather. It brings in demographics. It brings in economics, school um, performance. And the one I was most excited about to find out within 3.8 miles of my home, there's a contaminated site to bring in EPA and Superfund data. Um, and some of this they're doing programmatically in terms of in APIs. A lot of it they're just scraping. Um, they've also built a, a app called Open States, which they have this massive crowdsource scraping operation that I don't think they have all 50, but they're pretty close. And they've gone through and scraped every state legislature's website information about the uh, elected officials, how they're voting, and they're also bringing in campaign finance records. And they have a, uh, a mobile app that's geolocated that wherever I'm standing, show me who's the representative here, what are they voting on, how much are they paying. 
or how much they can be paid, I should say, um, in terms of fundraising. You know, there's not a lot of analysis to this, but it's still super useful. It's telling us this information in a way that most people can't get at any other way. Um, so what's exciting about that is, is some of the hit automation. I also want to mention that I don't have a slide for it, but um, the LA Times is, is taking this in a lot of ways to a whole new level. That they're writing scripts that every night are hitting the arrest logs for the LA County Sheriff's Department and then comparing them against their database of famous people. Um, and they're comparing them against their list of noteworthy occupations. So council members and judges and low hands are all being referenced in this arrest log. And they get an email every night at 2 or 3 AM, I think Ben said, their, uh, their, report, their crime reporters, their assistant energy editors are going to get an alert saying, hey, somebody interesting got picked up last night. There's probably a story here. And they're hours ahead. If the Sheriff's Department ever does put out a press release, they're, they're so far ahead of the game. Um, so they're automating that. And you know they have scripts that hit the US Geological Survey's website. And every time there's a tremor, it tweets it, it writes the brief, it puts it into their CMS, it publishes automatically, saying you know, 50 miles from Torrance, California to the west, there is a 1.8 Richter scale earthquake. And I'm making all those numbers up. Um, but you know, this is amazing. This is stuff that if we were reporting on it, we were doing it so far after the fact that it wasn't even interesting. Um, the fact that they can do it in pro programmatically um, blows my mind. And they're doing the analysis with it as well. With their crime, in addition to the arrest, they're getting dumps of crime reports for every neighborhood in Los Angeles. They map that automatically, and it builds the visualizations in terms of time, in terms of types of crime in their website. If you ever go to uh, Mapping LA, their crime map site. So any neighborhood is showing you uh, what's the crime there right now, how does that compare over the last year, you know, what, where are they seeing spikes, and the algorithm is says when the crime in a certain uh, category, whether it's assaults or uh, robberies or whatever it is, that neighborhood goes above their average, you know, this is an exceptional type, and it's, it's sending out tweets, again, it's writing the briefs for online, it's sending out emails to people that subscribe. Um, and all of that is, um, you know, largely due to Ben Welch and his colleagues, and their sort of hacker mentality that, that we can do this better. Um, I want to show you one more project, or talk about this just a little bit. Um, and this is something that is really incredible. Uh, this is not as much automated. Um, there was a lot of old school um, shoe leather reporting involved. But the, the way that they, the USA Today did this, this is their go to factories project that ran last year. The idea is that there are hundreds. This is a little known fact in this American Journal of Public Health in 2001. Somebody wrote that there are hundreds of these former lead processing plants um, that had been around that posed significant um, risks to their communities, and they'd pretty much been forgotten about. The factories had been knocked down, they'd been covered over, new things had been built, um, and people really had no idea. So they, a couple things to point out here. They went and researched every single one of these, and for many of them, they found this thing here. This is a Sanborn map, which is a really fire insurance map um, from the, what, 1930s? They went to the Library of Congress, grabbed the Sanborn map, overlaid it on top of Google Maps, so you can see exactly where this plant used to be, this one in Carteret. Um, and you can turn on the satellite on Google and see what's there now. And it was very interesting in my old neighborhood in Jersey City, where you know, I thought I'd walk halfway from an elementary school to three blocks of kids in here, there was one of these former smelting plants that had all kinds of potential still there. And then they wrote you know, a huge series of sort of traditional, um, what we think of the takeout project for print. Um, but they built this website that anybody could explore it, they could look at their own communities, and they could see, you know, especially if they moved there before you're less than 60 years old, you might not have any idea this was there. None of this has been dealt with. Um, or I guess it had to be. They did photo, they did video. Uh, this was really kind of a master class in, in building these interactives and 
bring the power of this new medium together with the sort of traditional journalism. Um, and in the explain we're going to say that with the What's the key to these projects? Using the programming techniques to automate parts of the reporting and the publishing process, um, and dealing with these modest sized data sets. Um, they made it interactive, they unlocked it for readers, and they brought context to it. Um, and, and that's really the key. All this scraping and munging and automation, um, it has to tell the story. Um, it's got to bring more to it. So this brings us, there's sort of a long way around to this weekend. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to build something together, and it's going to be rooted in these sort of best practices and virtues of both of these worlds. Um, you know, this is about building a, a piece of software, um, but it's also about telling the story. Um, you, the programmers, understand these techniques. You understand how to work with data. You know how to build and manage a database and run a server. Um, you know how to do the uh, the back end and the front end, um, and integrate these moving parts. But then, that's a lot to do, but there's a lot more to this process than just that. There's you know, helping with the design, there's building the wireframes, coming up with the concept, working on the, the presentation for the judges, developing that story, um, working on the branding, and creating the, the GitHub and the Twitter account for the project to, to have life of its own. Um, so there's a lot there to do, and there's a lot for both sides. It, this, the good spot, I think, for these projects to land, of uh, these areas that each of us, I think all of us, um, transparency in, in our data, accountability, um, you know, reminding people, hey, these multi plants uh, may have been knocked down, but they haven't disappeared. Somebody's got to take care of this. Um, Money and safety are kind of the two keys, right? Those are, you can never really go wrong if you're sort of back to, uh, to explain to the reader how is this costing you money and how is this endangering your family. Uh, if, you can, if you can do both of them, uh, even better, right? Um, but the key is, you know, unlike our Snoke apps, these projects have to have enough graph. That has to be so what? Um, why does this application matter? Um, you know, how, not only how is it useful, but why should I care? And the other thing to keep in mind is when we're doing all this and sort of getting lost in the minutia of building something, and this comes from what our friends at ProPublica, is their, their best coding practices. Um, so this is their gist for it, but down here, don't blow your deadline and don't be wrong. Um, you know, that's the other key to all of this. It should matter, there should be a point. Um, but you can't have bad data there. Um, you don't lead people astray. Uh, so let me just offer a little bit of advice, um, and I'll start with the very few don'ts here. Um, don't give up. Maybe that's obvious. Um, you're not married to your team this weekend. If you find that it's moving in a direction you're not as interested in, um, come talk to us, we'll find another team. There might be a different project that better fits your interests, your background, your experience. Um, we'll mix it up. Don't get overwhelmed. Uh, there's a lot of new stuff I think we're all going to be learning on both sides. Uh, don't try to learn to code, um, is another key. Uh, if you have a little bit of coding background, that's fantastic. You can sit with the developers and ask, you know, maybe ask them a little bit um, about where, where you're going. but. You can concentrate on a lot of the other pieces without necessarily knowing uh, which classes are being instantiated uh, here and there. Um, and one other suggestion um, that uh, my friend Brian Donahue had, had mentioned to me is that, and this is a great point, that good coding uh, is a lot like sleeping, um, that you can get into the zone. You can be asleep for hours, but if you're not in the rapid eye movement stage, it's not going to be very good. Uh, if you are in that stage, you get interrupted. It's like you never slept at all. Um, a lot of coders, you may see at a certain point, they put on their headphones and pull up their hoods and hunch down and just be in that zone. Um, and you probably don't want to go um, tapping your own shoulder or asking a lot of questions. Uh, which is going to lead to us to sort of our dudes. Um, do communicate and talk at the beginning about not only what your idea is, but what's everybody's role on the team. Um, 
what are we all going to be able to do together? What should everybody expect from one another? What is going to be the best way for us to, to talk? You know, some people are going to say, listen, in this box time, just send me an instant message. Send me an email. Other people are going to say, yeah, come sit next to me, and we'll talk as you go along. But if you have those conversations at the beginning, if everybody is on the right, uh, right page together, um, do work together to tell the story and find the data. Um, and collaborate on the, the interface, the design, the name, the branding. For the journalists, um, specifically, what can you do? Uh, think about what kind of apps would you use. You are journalists that make the best news consumers um, in, in addition to producing it. You know what's useful, you know, what do you use all the time. Um, you can bring that to it. You know, many of your B reporters, your subject matter experts, um, with, what are the data that you've worked with on your feet that you've never had the resources uh, to really explore? You've never been able to um, do more of them than just sort of pick out a record here and there for a story. Um, you know, if you are comfortable with Excel or Refine or all some scripting languages and you want to do some of the data cleaning and compare the data as the back end framework is being built, you can do part of that. Um, you can help draw the mock ups. Uh, and talk about what the interaction is going to be. Uh, and you can help craft the pitch for the judges, but perhaps most importantly, you can ask that nagging uh, managing editor question you get a lot. You know, the so what? Um, it, it doesn't make sense. Like, we may have a fantastic idea, but when you really mull it over, uh, there might not be much to it. Um, you want to make sure that it's something that uh, readers are going to get something out of and that it's not a house of cards, I guess. Um, and for the reporters, obviously you, you bring a lot to this as well. Um, where you can, you have these sort of upfront conversations with people that, the journalists that can do some coding, pair programming is an incredibly valuable tool and a way to learn. And if you're comfortable sitting down next to them, maybe not saying here's what every semicolon is uh, doing here, um, or every filmy bracket, but you can say, maybe walk them through the concepts of what you're setting up. Um, in, in broad terms, uh, so that the journalists can get a sense of you know, what is the process for building something. It's not just emailing a story to the web producer uh, to have them put it up online. Um, try to get a sense where you can of how you create something. Um, and probably most important for everybody is to have fun, that um, we're all spending a lot of time this weekend together. Um, this is a huge investment that we all have. Um, we have jobs, we have school, we have families, um, we also like to spend time with. So if you're not having fun, it is sort of a waste. Um, enjoy yourself. Uh, if, and if, again, if your team isn't where you think you'll be uh, any more out of it, we are right. Just, like I said, it's not a marriage. Um, and then finally, you know, the whole key is, hopefully by tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be talking to judges. We're going to have some really incredible projects to look over. Um, so let's all you know, uh, look back to the, the original hackers at, at MIT. You know, let's take this stuff apart, let's figure out how it works, and uh, find a new way to put it back together and make it better. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, and I will pass it over to Mark.